hello everyone and welcome to, after quite a long break, uh, a new episode of uh, Review Ed with my longtime uh, friend and of course uh, online education fellow Chef Rajendran. I am uh, Kirsten Winkler and uh, yeah, well, as I said, Chef, glad to have you back after quite a break. Yeah, it's very good to be back as well, Kirsten. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think it's one of my my objectives in my work now to to regularly see and revise what what is working, uh, where are the hopefully strengths of uh, EduQuest and what do people want. And what I found is definitely um, opinion and like our take or the experts take on um, stories in online education. And on the other hand, Review App was always uh, fun for me to do. So I thought, um, yeah, would be a pity not to, to continue with it. And so we are back on it. Oh, yeah, no, it's, de it's definitely a great show. I've had a lot of good feedback about the few couple we've done, so it's cool. very, very good. No, that's good. So then, um, well, you received uh, the little doc, and we are basically, uh, or we basically have four big blocks today. We are starting off with the uh, adaptive learning sector, and of course, as we are show for, for startups, so startups in the adaptive learning space, then talking a little bit academia and uh, science and the new, I think, very interesting um, things happening there. And at the end, uh, public uh, education and um, maybe some stories in, in free education. So let's see how that goes and how much time <laughs> it takes. Um, so some, uh, back in October, two big funding stories. Um, Grocket on the one hand with uh, 7 million and then the very big one uh, Newton with a series D of uh, 33 million um, pretty impressive for uh, online education I think uh, both although I feel it's a little bit a buzzword over the last uh, couple of weeks or months maybe everybody is increasingly talking about adaptive learning um, and apparently uh, investors see a good opportunity there and like to invest in uh, in those startups. Uh, so what do you think of the two rounds? Um, do you also see maybe in connection to the next story, Newton and Pearson, uh, are we going to see an acquisition in the near future of Newton by Pearson? Yeah. So that's very interesting. So the two rounds, first of all, I think Grocket and Newton are two very different businesses. So Newton is, you know, already doing business, very successful, mm -hmm. got good revenue. So it's not at all surprising that they've got this uh, money and they've got interest from people like Pearson. Grocket, although Grocket video or Grocket questions I absolutely loved, I'm not sure that they have a revenue model yet or not one I could see. So that's a bit surprising. Although they do have a brilliant product, it seems like the sort of product that will work very well if it's open to everyone rather than, you know, you're trying paid access. Mm. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see where they go with that and where they find revenue. Or Yeah, it, it's true compared to some of the other test prep uh, uh, startups in the video space who go for a classic uh, subscription model. So, um, I mean, uh, on these standardized tests, uh, it is obvious that you have uh, a certain amount uh, of, of students who, definitely need to prepare for those tests and uh, why not mm -hmm. learning with, with video. Um, so for me, yes, having a subscription model is sort of a, a no-brainer and I think you can build a decent business. I don't know if it is or has the potential to be an enormous business or if it's more like a body business or whatever you want to call it, um, as they are quite a few in that space and, and maybe when you have several players everybody can have a viable business. So maybe Grocket, um, and I don't know, it's also a Series D, so they, are, they have been around for quite some time. And mm -hmm. 
I feel a little bit the same. They are still figuring it out. Apparently, they have investors who are tolerant enough to, to let them do, um, to presumably or, or hopefully come up with something maybe really big um, in terms of a business model, something more innovative nobody else yeah. um, has thought of. or. Yeah, but I mean, I sort of feel like their killer product is the video question and answer, mm -hmm. which if you put behind a paywall, there wouldn't be enough people using it to make it effective. Right. So, mm -hmm. so we'll see. We'll see where that goes. But yeah, I mean, test prep is absolutely huge. Things where Newton began, began as well. Yeah. And that, it's always going to be big, isn't it? I think so. As it, it's always, uh, there's always enough uh, users who really uh, need this uh, kind of product. And um, I also feel that they really want to have the, the adoption by the masses. So, um, so probably making it open, uh, at least at the moment, is the right way to, to go to, to really build a huge user base. Although, mm -hmm. um, from my feeling, I am also always a little bit worried or doubtful when a company and I'm I'm now see that happening when I when I talk with yeah startup founders increasingly more often that they get investment and they tell me well we are figuring our business model out and I'm always a little bit hmm I don't know <laughs> uh, I would be I would feel more comfortable well, myself, uh, knowing what my business model is and then building upon that instead of maybe trying for a year or something like that and um, yeah, and trust, trusting that uh, my investors uh, stay patient and support me and don't put pressure on me. No, absolutely. But I think sort of that's part of the game now. I mean, we're still testing several business models. I think we always will be. And it's worked very well for a lot of investors to sure. sort of trust companies like that. Yeah. So it's a bit shaky. But mm. we'll see. I mean, I think the good thing is they're both using sort of the adaptive learning approach, which is sort of about time, really, that education started taking it seriously. Uh, we do this ourselves, and we kind of were inspired by by computer games, believe it or not, and the way they constantly manage to stay on the edge of your ability level. So we thought, actually, this is the way education should work as well. Um, and I think it really is the future. It's now everything is pretty much going to be like that. Hmm. So the next, so I mean, the association between Newton and Pearson, Pearson's MyLab products have sort of flat web content for a range of subjects. It's absolutely huge. To make that all adaptive will make it so much more valuable to the students, I think, hmm. there. Uh, than it currently is. Uh, and what do you have uh, so in uh, in the virtual world of uh, of English City? So where do you have uh, the uh, adaptive learning elements uh, implemented when um, the students are learning and or taking their courses uh, in this uh, environment? So uh, people not familiar with your with your product or or the world, um, how do we have to imagine? Um, how how do you challenge or the teachers how do the teachers challenge them um, like when immersed in in this virtual environment? Yeah, it's actually between interactions. So the way our system works is a student signs up to languagelab.com, they do a quick online level test, and then they come in and they do a level assessment with a real teacher, mm -hmm. and their sort of objectives and their level strengths and weaknesses are put into our system, and they get recommended classes to go to. Um, and each time they go to a class, a teacher then inputs more data on what they're good at, what they're bad at, what they need to improve. And this, again, recommends more classes to them. So the classes that any given student goes to in a month is sort of unique to them rather than trying to get everybody through the same course. Mm -hmm. So the system, again, it tries to adapt to recommend what is suitable for you based on your sort of strengths and weaknesses and your objectives. So that's how our system works. And the input... See, this is a tricky thing because it's language. The input into the system comes from teachers, right? So teachers can properly assess your accuracy, fluency, grammar, everything else, and put it into a computer to give you recommendations, um, which is absolutely vital for language learning. You need a teacher to do that part. Uh, these guys, Newton especially, they're 
applying their adaptive algorithm, which is entirely automated, to language learning, it makes me think it's more of blended products. Certainly Pearson's, Pearson's mm. MyLab, it's you know, designed for the teacher in the classroom to use sure. with their face-to-face -face teaching rather than a standalone solution. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's still a step forward on, on the flat web sort of content side. The mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, uh, Pearson, uh, obviously, Newton is not the only company um, they are working together with, but um, I think they put themselves in the position to um, try out different uh, things in, in different fields of, uh, or aspects of learning, then see what they like. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, being, uh, I mean, I think they are also an investor in, uh, in Newton, so um, they definitely have a word to say, uh, I suppose, in what direction the company is uh, developing, not only with um, the collaboration with Pearson, but probably have some impact on the, like, overall um, strategy. And, yeah, I mean, they are in the position to see and evaluate uh, do we like it? Do we like it enough to maybe even buy it? I mean, a company with um, that much funding under their belt now, um, there's only very few players, I think, in specifically in education who are making these uh, big investments and um, that have enough money to, um, yeah. to maybe acquire Newton. Do you think that could be something uh, interesting to Pearson, let's say, within the next um, 18 months? I, I definitely think so. I mean, Pearson have this long-term strategy to be an entirely digital publisher. Yeah. And they need sort of things like this to do it. So they're very aggressive with their mergers and acquisitions. Newton, again, is a great business. They've already proven themselves largely. Mm -hmm. They're just scaling now. Um, yeah. And it's a mutually beneficial partnership. So Pearson are in a lot of other markets, a lot of other subjects that Newton are not. And they can sort of help them get in, give them an easy in to get across all these verticals. That's so, true, yeah. yeah, it'll be mutually beneficial for both, I think, if they do that, go down that path. And certainly, like you said, Pearson are one of the few people in the mm. education space that can write that check to buy a company <laughs> like Newton. Yes, and I mean, they, they, they have proven what was their latest acquisition. I think it was something close to the uh, 300 million mark. And uh, yeah. if we sum up uh, all um, four rounds of, of Newton, they must be somewhere close to... I, I don't know that exactly now, but I think towards the 70 plus million. So, mm. uh, and and as you said, they are performing uh, rather well as a business. So, um, yeah, who can write an X by by X so and so check? Um, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, that's something. Uh -huh. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me that the discussions already happened behind the scenes for Pearson <laughs> to make this big commitment for you know yeah. to. They, they they probably want to see how it works um, now with uh, together with the courses, uh, mm -hmm. Pearson and Newton, and this integration, and um, then probably have all options open and and simply see whether they they like it enough to actually buy it or if they have um, have it run as a successful but still se sort of separate company. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what do you think of the um, the last story? Um, so the last funding just announced, um, I think, uh, yeah, two days ago on December 7th, um, the 11 million for Dreambox. So again, a startup in um, math education, but catering the uh, K-12 sector. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also have this concept of... Um, uh, having a strong curriculum adapted to each of the 50 um, states in the United States, uh, but still um, taking into consideration and, and serving the individual needs of uh, each child in, in the class. Do you think this is sort of a... Um, there's a sort of a trend having something in, in STEM as it's so highly pushed, at least over there in, in the States, um, that everybody goes into math and science now and a little less in, in languages 
or is it just like periodically as as always? Yeah, I think maths and sciences probably lend themselves better to this type of environment than yeah. languages do. I mm. think that's the trick that everybody spotted. So it's and obviously you know every high school child needs a good maths and science school, or they need English too. But so so there's a big big market there. Again, I've not really tried Dreambox, but it's very catered to the K-12 curriculum, yeah. so it makes me think it's kind of it's making the best of the system that's there rather than being something revolutionary, mm -hmm. if you like, or disruptive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a step step forward is always a good thing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, to or from what I've read is uh, that they sort of enhanced existing curriculums, but but always when you cater public education, uh, you you must work within the framework of the of the 50 states, which which I think or I imagine is rather complicated already to have a well. It, it comes the worst case scenario having 50 different curriculums mm -hmm. and um, yeah I think they concentrated of uh, enhancing or, or focusing on the strength and then um, as you said adding this this element of uh, adaptedness to to the individual child and their needs so sort of uh, then also facilitating um, the teacher's lives um, rather than having something really, really new. But seems to be something solid. I yeah. think uh, investors can understand uh, easily. Absolutely. So <laughs> was yeah. probably also a good thing to I mean, uh, to pitch it that way. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the market's already there for them, and it's absolutely huge. So it's a brilliant move on their part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think you know, adaptive people don't really have a choice now but to do something adaptive. Otherwise, all you've really got is a textbook online, mm -hmm. and then you know, what what's the big advantage of a textbook online if the students already have textbooks or they have you know, they're sitting in classrooms without computers in front of them. Yeah, I agree. So you you need to add a lot more value now to sort of do an online product. So I think we're going to see everything almost have this adaptive nature to it. Mm -hmm. Let's move into our next topic uh, around academia and, and science stuff, um, which also seems to um, take off or attract uh, yeah, much more discussion around it. And the first thing uh, I would like to talk about is academia.edu. So they raised another round of 4.5 million, which sums up to a total of almost uh, 7 million um, dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, so their take seems to be, uh, without having it tried myself, but they say to publish academic papers uh, takes a long time, um, sometimes several years. Um, it's the only way to gain reputa reputation in the world of uh, researchers, scientists. And what they are going to do is not really a replacement for uh, publishing those papers, but uh, they want to make um, the interaction between researchers all over the world easier, more time efficient, so that they can talk about their newest findings, newest research um, on the platform, um, on this social network of academia.edu. What do you think? Is that something the world needed? Uh, does it democratize science, scientific research? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, because I signed up to this site, I don't know, maybe a year ago, maybe a bit longer. <laughs> Um, and I have pu published absolutely nothing on it. <laughs> but yeah. and I've seen a few people have. I get messages every week saying new people are following me, but there's nothing there to see. And the issue for me personally is that you know content's already going to my blog, the company mm -hmm. blog, company white mm -hmm. papers. Um, do I don't really get around to putting it here as well. Mm. This is what it's going to have to compete with. So even the people whose sort of research I follow, I can follow them from their wikis, from their blogs, from their other sites. Um, and I think the problem academia.edu is having is that people are putting it on there first, on these other sites first, and not really getting around to putting it on this site. Um, but still, I think you know, once if you when you do write a paper, if you do have time to put it on here, it's all it's going to be a very good thing. They have amazing Google rankings, if nothing else, for when you search for someone's name. Yeah. 
But yeah, I was also uh, asking myself, this is an uh, interesting point you mentioned, because um, I was actually yeah. thinking, so how does it enhance my, my reputation? The Google ranking is an uh, interesting aspect, as, um, well, we all know that um, the world of uh, researchers and, and scientific publications is still, you need to be in this or that magazine. And I don't know if uh, academia.edu will really be able to have an impact in, in changing this, like uh, yeah. maybe the shift was from uh, like more traditional media to to now online media. I don't know if this is like if the science world is already ready for uh, disruption in, in that respect. Although I see your point of having a great Google ranking and uh, having my my research just just then uh, much more visible. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it lowers my chances to be published if uh, then a journal says, oh, well, but you published, sort of published um, over there first, so um, we want exclusiveness and... No, not really. I don't think academic journals would be too worried about the exclusiveness. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you see something in an academic journal, you know it's been peer-reviewed and that gives you a sense of its quality. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, lots of criticisms of the peer review process and it can be very subjective at times. But uh, at least there's that sort of barrier there. Whereas yeah. I can put anything on academia.edu and you don't know if I've made it up or it's real or, you know, what's going yeah, on. Yeah. So there's a lot of trust there. So I think it's very good for visibility, very good for finding other academics' work. Mm -hmm. But you still have to do this sort of validation process on everything you find. Uh, whereas you have to do slightly less yeah. of it on, on a journal. But on the other side, you get the information quite quickly and easily, whereas otherwise you'd have to wait for a journal to come out mm -hmm. or, or even for something. It'll take a while, like you said, for something to get approved for a journal. Definitely. Um, and, I mean, we have sort of a trend in that sector um, as well, maybe not so much in terms of a social network, but, uh, I mean, with you over there in London having Mendeley, um, so that that things are happening in science that people put their research papers um, online and want a database and, or are also using a database or exchange with colleagues. Um, I think, yeah, that's, that's sort of a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, Interesting will be, I mean, close to 7 million U.S. dollars, um, the, uh, the business model will be interesting um, to, to see, um, is it similar to a story later on um, at Modo, being a more closed social network for um, a certain or specific group of people, mm -hmm. um, so to make the, the difference with, with Facebook, being too too wide, everybody is on there, not really um, like uh, serious talk is, is uh, taking place there. Um, but, uh, I mean, we also saw Ning, and so will it be possible to, to have a social network with a viable business model other than ads or Yeah, that's a very good like question. That? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess they could try something like a paper published model. I mean, one mm. thing I really do like about this site is, say, if I publish an article in an academic journal, it goes out in that journal, and then it's after that it becomes very difficult for people to find. They have to either pay a lot of money for it or they're on the journal's website, or, yeah. or, or they sort of, there's nothing else they can really do. You have to pay a lot of money on the journal's website. I would much rather put it out there for free for everybody to be able to see, mm -hmm. um, and this allows me to do that. And if they say, you know, you have to pay two dollars to put it up there and we'll host it for you for life, then, I mean, it would be worth my time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, how much they would have to charge to make that worth their while, but that's a potential model for them. Let's see the uh, next two stories sort of um, as two opposite approaches to a little bit the, the same thing with um, with Science Exchange and Late Night Labs. So uh, Late Night Labs uh, probably more um, sort of in the direction of uh, English City as well, um, creating a 
virtual lab, so um, having science experiments, uh, the experience taken online without having the real life explosions. Um, I have to say that I kind of like the idea. Um, I could see that in a variety of, of cases, not only in K-12 or higher ed, but uh, but actually also for for sort of private people who want to brush up their um, knowledge in in various different science uh, subjects. Whereas um, the other one, the science exchange, is more like you you share facilities if you don't have the um, and we all agree, I guess, um, the equipment is often very expensive, so why not share with another facility, another university or uh, or college and work together on, on some, some of the projects. So do you think there's um, a basis or ground for both approaches? Do you think um, eventually one will have the edge over the other um, or what or simply what approach do you like better? Um, it's interesting. So they both seem to be very, very different. So one lets you find experiments from all sorts of places or, or even pay for experiments to contribute to them. The other one is an online simulation mm -hmm. kind of tool, which seems to be aimed at kids. Is that correct? Yes, at the moment, yes, although they say um, towards the end of the article that they could um, imagine it in, in different scenarios as well. But at the moment, it is more targeted, which probably makes, makes sense. Yeah, so, well, I mean, what I thought about Late Night Labs is I got it I sort of playing around, doing mm -hmm. little experiments, um, and it sort of tied you to this paradigm of beakers and little bits of metal and thermometers and... Mm -hmm. um, and really, when we're teaching kids science, we only use those things because you're stuck in a classroom. You know, you yeah. can't, you know, you can't crash a car into a, a vat of acid and see what happens. Well, we Whereas saw what what happened yesterday with uh, Miss Busters and the cannonball in uh, where was it near Dublin? <laughs> oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it hit, it okay. missed the target and it went through a couple of houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a brilliant example. Um, so if you're going to sort of bring science simulation in on you know, into a virtual environment, I think that's the sort of thing you should be doing to get kids interested. It should be cannonballs flying through the air, crashing into things and, you know, things dropping into acid and explo exploding rather than, you know, beakers on the table and thermometers and things like that. Um, and I think that'll be a lot more engaging for the kids. But, yeah, so, I mean, it's a good idea, I think. Yeah, but, uh, because I thought, I mean, you on a much more professional um, level, but uh, when you build the oil rigs, uh, you you can train um, professionals on the job, and I and I mean I suppose um, trying to to think back um, in, in time. So I think I would actually have enjoyed having a simulation like this and and doing some of the more exciting experiments. Uh, mm -hmm. You cannot. Um, have in school and yeah I mean I I like the idea so we we will see and okay. yeah I mean I was a big fan of school in actually doing the physical experiments so I'd mm -hmm. be quite sad if they took those away and you just had to sit in front of the computer maybe you could go for the more risky uh, yeah absolutely <laughs> anything that could kill you you've got to do on the computer yeah um, yes because the uh, I mean was it w what it was about in in uh, chemistry and physics was the experiments um, for me as well, and I enjoyed those lessons most. So I guess I would enjoy um, doing some of this stuff either as homework maybe or some yeah extracurricular um, activities uh, on the internet. Actually, why not? Yeah, we we'll see. It's it's still pretty new. So, I mean, yeah, and I think a lot depends on how the teachers use it. You know, if they give the kids a set of problems and say, okay, now here's this simulation, try and find it, we might get some interesting results rather than trying to teach up front how different things react. Yeah. yeah. So, Shiv, let me ask you, how difficult is it actually to get into college or university in the UK? 
Um, if you're European, I think it's not very difficult at all now. It's mm -hmm. probably difficult to get into the you know, very top ones or the extremely popular courses. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think it's very, very easy. Yeah, so it seems to be um, different in the States, at least, uh, to get into the college of your dreams. Um, and our sponsor this week, uh, exceptly.com, helps you to do exactly that. So um, they say um, that they can uh, even enhance your chances to going into or uh, being accepted in your target college by 80% through guiding you uh, and giving you little challenges and tasks to work on um, every day to actually make the application process more successful for you. Um, do you think this is uh, something students, uh, specifically if they want to go um, and be accepted in U.S. colleges, um, need and uh, they want to do this process online? Could you yeah. imagine that? So, so let me understand this a bit. So they actually, it's kind of like coaching to prepare you for your university exam. Yeah, so they have, uh, they have like uh, expert coaches. Um, most of the time you are challenged um, that they give you little tasks depending on um, the profile you, so we are in the adaptive uh, learning again, so you fill in a profile obviously with your um, objectives and what you want to achieve um, and then being in this process of uh, two to three months prior to entering college they um, well they tell you today you should work on this and that and uh, our experts um, yeah um, recommend um, that you um, work on this task for example or uh, write this again and um, therefore uh, actually boost your chances to, to be accepted really in the college uh, or from the college uh, where you want to go. No, I think that is a great idea and we have a lot of students training with us to learning English with us because they want to get university acceptance in here, the UK, mm -hmm. US and something like this that actually sets them apart would be quite good. Um, obviously I haven't tried it yet but in principle, it sounds like a brilliant idea. <laughs> we are not in the target age group anymore. No. <laughs> uh -uh. But yeah, but uh, I want to thank them for their support, and you can find them at exceptly.com, and they are also ex at exceptly on on Twitter. So say them thank you, and we thank them for their support of EduQuest. Okay. So, um, let's have a look a little bit into the free education uh, model and, well, I don't, I think many people have done it um, over the last couple of months and uh, the Khan Academy is in everybody's mouth uh, still and, I mean, I wrote um, a piece on a uh, big thing, uh, actually focusing um, on the economics of education. As many people uh, are discussing the educational value and the, the knowledge tree, um, of course, uh, Khan Academy uh, has built um, and is continuing to build. Also, um, a little bit the criticism which we are I think touching on in, uh, in just a moment that Khan basically knows nothing about how people learn. So coming from the more traditional educators corner. Um, but uh, actually isn't, isn't that great that Khan Academy um, with the grants uh, from Gates Foundation or Sullivan, um, mm. others, I mean, they have raised I think uh, currently around 11 million, if I'm not completely mistaken. Wow. Um, they still maintain this not-for-profit. Um, mm -hmm. Isn't that still um, a, a great thing that uh, many people overlook when they discuss Khan Academy, that they still make uh, education accessible, um, well, on the one hand via the videos that um, are still entirely available on YouTube. Um, on the other hand, 
also with the knowledge tree education free for for anybody who wants to educate themselves on a certain topic uh, no absolutely I, I i really don't understand when people criticize sort of a free education product um it's you know you're not obliged to use it and they're putting a lot of valuable videos up there for anybody to use at any time they want and it's really up to you how you use it I mean it's criticism like Khan doesn't understand how people learn it's you know it's up to you how you use the video he's not forcing you to do it in any particular way so yeah I mean that sort of really sort of baffles me of why there's any criticism at all of free content I think that's coming from the uh, traditional educator side as I as I mentioned before people who are yeah not overly happy that their efforts maybe in the world of education are a little bit overshaded or, or shadowed by uh, Khan now um, made the uh, savior of, of learning. And I think this is somehow a role he didn't pick himself no, uh, from the beginning. So he was sort of either pushed or he uh, he slided a little bit into this role and um, I mean now he is somehow adopting it and I don't want to like overly defend him I mean of course he has a certain way of uh, of acting and um, saying yeah I know that there's research carried out oh, and yeah. uh, why not I probably won't have a look at it for Khan Academy <laughs> so yeah. it's, always, it's always in a certain style um, yeah but on the other hand if everything uh, w was so great before mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have needed a Khan Academy or he wouldn't have had such incredible success so yeah. if uh, if every or if any traditional educator or not any but a considerable number had put their lectures on the on the internet and made it freely accessible for for anyone yeah I think I mean he has been disruptive in a big sense in that I think the role of the traditional education now is changing rapidly mm -hmm. from delivering knowledge to actually giving sort of one on one feedback and sort of personalized mm -hmm. support and helping people when they're stuck. And that's still a very valuable role. So I, I mean I can't see teachers disappearing in any subject in that function. You'll still need the feedback, you still need the support, you'll still need the inspiration that great teachers provide. Um, even if the computer can provide you with all the knowledge. So I think I mean teachers really need to see themselves as fulfilling that function. And if students can gain the knowledge themselves before even coming to the classroom, then they'll get much more value from the class and the time with the teacher. Absolutely, already coming with a certain level and the, the teacher can then really concentrate on, I think, what is what will then be uh, most interesting for, for both parties involved. So really concentrating on um, some sophisticated uh, points, some discussion uh, mm -hmm. and not, uh, I mean, Nobody, I suppose, um, enjoyed in, in their school life. The teacher, uh, I, I suppose, was, was teaching um, this very lesson for the last uh, 10 years. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. I mean, and that really doesn't even work. I mean, we've been talking about adaptive learning. If you've got yeah. a class of 20 people, half you're going to be going too fast for half of them and they're going to be lost and too slow for the other half and they're going to be bored so you're kind of stuck it's much better you know if the students can learn the information themselves mm. and come to you at, at a certain stage when they need your when they need help in this article on the criticism uh, criticism on Khan Academy or Khan himself uh, rises I particularly disliked uh, one passage where the um, in which the author stated so I didn't mind as long as he maintained the YouTube channel with first uh, a few hundred or then uh, a few thousand videos um, as other educators put their stuff on the internet um, as well um, he then says or he continues to say um, I had to step step up as soon as um, he was sort of taken into the uh, public education space in in the states, and I thought so. Like, 
wow, so this person completely, um, I felt at least reading it, maybe uh, it was just not, uh, it was just phrased in a little inf an unfortunate way, but uh, I read it uh, like this, um, ah, when you're doing educational video, that's inferior to real teaching anyway yeah. so we don't care about this uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of edu this sort of uh, educational material and um, i don't yeah. know i think that's missing uh, a little bit what has been going on in uh, online education over the past uh, years already and uh, is sort of coming from which i can understand traditional point of view but um, i don't know if uh, if some adoption of uh, like new ideas, new movements wouldn't be only beneficial to everybody involved in education and not uh, staying in their silos of, uh, well, we are in public education, we are in higher education, mm. uh, we do something online, we are a startup in education. I, I feel the people have to sort of first start speaking with one another and then also working together more um, frequently and also accepting other approaches and uh, other oh, yeah. opinions. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it needs to be seen as an opportunity to try something new that you may add value, you may discover something doesn't work, but you need to try and learn all these things and it's part of being a teacher. Um, you know, I'm sure it's possible to use these videos in the classroom in a way that was bad and not helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, that's down to the teacher. So, you know, I think teachers need to become, or at least most of us, more professional than job than they currently are. We've got to stay, especially in English language teaching, where a lot of schools, you go into a classroom, you're given a textbook, you go for a passage, and sort of there's very, most of the skill you'd expect from a teacher has been taken away in that process. It's a bit like mm -hmm. a factory production line. Um, and if you stick these videos into that sort of process, uh, you're going to get a bad learning experience. Mm -hmm. So, but with more professional teachers, like you said, you can consider new approaches, you know, experiment, learn, learn new things, see what they're doing. Um, any tool can be potentially brilliant. So, yeah. I, I absolutely agree and I, uh, I think it is completely unnecessary that people are afraid or worried that um, teachers are going to be replaced. There's always and will always be need for great teachers, just yeah. not for mediocre teachers. Uh, I, I, so. I, I, absolutely. I can't remember where I heard the quote, but someone said, if you can replace a teacher by, with a computer, you should. Good. So, exactly. yeah, I mean, they must be a very bad teacher. So we don't exactly. need Exactly. Yeah, I read that on Twitter um, not a long time ago as well, and uh, I really said, well, that's, that's to the point. Yeah. Yeah, and then maybe those teachers that are about to be replaced are complaining. Are they? <laughs> they should, yeah. Uh, last story about the free education um, coming from um, University of the People, mm -hmm. uh, making, um, sort of putting out um, a, a, a press release and also some numbers um, comparing, and I mean, I mentioned that Khan Academy have uh, raised 11 million, we talked about the enormous 33 million of uh, Newton, 7 million um, of Crockett, uh, Dreambox 11, so uh, basically we are not uh, like uh, missing uh, big numbers currently in education. So um, coming from the University uh, of the People that 6 million are actually sufficient forever, so not per year, forever to educate the world and I was sort of surprised, although I have to say I, I didn't think about it, how much money do you need to, to educate um, a big number of people and, and make a big impact. However, I was surprised that it was only six million mm -hmm. uh, compared with some of the uh, sums and, and numbers we are used to talk about um, today. So taking basically taking uh, free courses from uh, MIT and other well-known um, universities, uh, having 
educators working for the University of the People for free to streamline the free, freely available material, to um, work with the students, um, have the peer-to-peer, -peer, so the student-to-student -student work, and then actually uh, allowing a big number of people coming to an at least undergraduate degree in computer science and business administration, and we will see um, what they are going to roll out as their next uh, study program, I think is a great thing. And no, absolutely. And surprisingly low, low number. It's an amazingly number number. I mean, if that's true, I mean, I'm sure they can make that in corporate sponsorships quite easily every year. Um, that's uh, all sort of in one off. But, I mean, it's a brilliant idea, and I really hope it will work. I can't help be skeptical about sort of the mm -hmm. sum of money and, and the sort of magnitude of the task involved. But, I mean, it, it would be amazing if they can pull that off. Yeah, I think uh, as it's really, uh, depending on the country, uh, the students pay an administration fee as low as between 10 to to $50 for the courses. Mm -hmm. But then um, taking free courseware and um, we are, or the University of the People is in the fortunate uh, situation that apparently there are enough educators who have the time and uh, who are paid uh, through their, uh, well, day job, um, who then have the qualification and the time to, to dedicate to this project and uh, work apparently entirely for free. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. to the education uh. must be free uh, slogan. <laughs> So, yeah, so you're not really educating the world. A big part of the world is paying money to be educated, which is subsidizing this other part. Yeah, uh, Which is I a nice so. model. Uh, which is, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, and we'll see. I mean, I think staffing will be their big challenge in maintaining quality, but hmm. hopefully you can do that just if they have enough. I, I am thinking, yeah, I'm thinking some years in the future, if the same um, could actually happen, what we see of... Um, of university alumni uh, now being successful in life and who want to give back and thank their university. So I imagine if somebody in India, thanks to University of the People, was able to succeed and make their undergraduate degree and then probably having, well, a, a plethora of more opportunities than compared uh, mm -hmm not having it, and um, who, th who then says, uh, for example, well, I, uh, now I'm successful in life, so I give a couple of hundred thousand, maybe, or even a million, and open this form of education to then, again, um, so and so many thousands of yeah. new students, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's the sort of thing where, you know, the Gates Foundation or Wellcome Trust could easily Mm -hmm. Sustain it for a good while. Um, yeah. I'm wondering that sort of the culture of giving back to your university, how big that is outside of the USA. And yeah, we trying, always yeah. only hear it from from the states. I yeah, say, I yeah. mean they're, they're trying to develop it here, but it's very very small still. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, I think wealthy foreigners subsidising things rather than people who've done well here. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, who knows? In the future, hopefully, we'll be as generous as the Americans are to their <laughs> universities. <laughs> I'm not sure. Why do you think um, this mindset uh, was able to be developed uh, yeah, mainly in the States? Because, yeah, I don't see it here in France. I, I, I don't know it from Germany. Um, I would have never thought of, <laughs> to be honest, mm -hmm. of, uh, of giving back to, to my university, uh, like, big scale, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea. I think America, perhaps, you know, some of the universities are set up as charities and non-profits mm. and private organizations that need public donations to exist, so they've had that culture for a very long time, whereas it's not been the case over here. Um, yeah, and, probably I mean, this whole um, thing of charity fundraisers in your, in, in your life. I mean, you start at preschool, do something like this, and then at every age. So um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's part of their yeah. DNA, probably. 
I think what's happening in the UK now, because university fees have just gone up quite a mm -hmm. lot, mm -hmm. um, is people are now seeing it as more of a service. Rather, I'm not getting something from the state, I'm paying my money and I'm getting something back. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to see how that would fit in with the sort of, now I'm going to donate more money to you afterwards. Uh, I think so only if you really feel you got the best education from the best people possible, then mm -hmm. then you are you when you when you can say exactly okay, this business course helped me to uh, to now be successful with my startup, for example. So mm -hmm. so then I could see that, and probably. Yeah. Uh, they also have this ecosystem. I mean, we know that amongst entrepreneurs, um, mentorship, yeah. uh, universities often already uh, collaborating or working together with businesses. So you probably see um, as, a, as a college or university student in the States, you probably, when you're good, see some opportunities and where to work uh, and so on, whereas here, when you graduate, I mean, you with Language Lab, myself, we created our own jobs, but yeah. otherwise it's not that I could rely on my university of making, at least making me some contacts with people where I might find work or uh, something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, that's definitely true. Um, I mean, it's strange. So, I mean, Language Lab, for example, started myself and David. We met on our master's course at King's College. Mm -hmm. um, and Jessie, who's our head of education here, who you met in London, she mm -hmm. did the same course a year afterwards. So there was that kind of networking going on at that level. I'm not amongst sure. Amongst students, yeah. Amongst uh, students. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure how much it was driven by university and how much it was more, mm -hmm. you know, us doing it, or David, especially from being American, from an American background. Is more yeah. used to that to that way of doing things, so I mean, hopefully we can develop it, and hopefully actually university of the people can develop it. But I think if actually lecturers from other universities are donating their time, there's no reason why it can't be successful. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, hopefully um, they will be able to add new courses, and um, then, as in our world, uh, yeah, it's still a lot about degrees and not only um, sort of the, uh, or let's put it the way, how do you prove that you have this knowledge? Um, yeah. Still today, the least of the companies l uh, actually give you a chance um, to, to prove what you know or to, to actually program something to prove um, when when you're already filtered out by not having a certain degree or yeah, diploma? Um, I don't, um, I don't know. Um, we've had a sort of very different experience, and it's probably large because we're a startup, I'm sure. If you go to a big corporation, they'll say, what did you get in your A-levels and what's your degree? Yeah. But here, I mean, we found what qualifications mean very, very little. Mm -hmm. You need to find some proof in the other person's background that they could actually deliver the skills you need them to, to deliver. So, you know, our coders have contributed to open source projects that, are, you know, that mm -hmm. allow you to verify that their coding quality is good. And um, marketing people, when you search for them online, they should have good visibility and good presence. Absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, um, and it's like that. So that's more valuable to us than the actual qualification or the university or the degree. In fact, oh, absolutely. That's how I look for for writers for for EduQuest uh, as well. Or it's it's not so much about the diploma, but uh, I would love to see that more, and also in the big corporations. I think in in the startup in our in our startup world, mm -hmm. um, it's getting more and more the the way you do it, which yeah. is great. I would like to see that um, transmitted into the DNA of, of some big companies as well. Would be great, but definitely, probably still some time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, last block: uh, public education. Um, at Modo, uh, raised fifteen million. So at Modo, a uh, secure social network for educators in, with their classes, students or educators with educators in uh, K-12, uh, having some considerable growth from uh, end of 2010 
50,000 people using it to now uh, half a million. Um, I talked with one of the founders of Edmodo, gosh, quite some time ago, and yeah, I was always asking myself, uh, hmm, is there enough need, room, people who want to have a secured network where they can where they are able to only talk with their peers. Is it again just a thing, a US thing? Is it possible to um, to yeah have the experience in, in in Europe? So, but apparently the investors believe in them. Fifty million is not bad at all. Um, and yeah, after being around for some time, they now. Uh, seem to add numbers uh, or members uh, in big numbers. So what's your take on that? Um, well, that, I mean, they're obviously doing very well, or well, doing very well, which is definitely a good thing. Um, my question is, are, is it being used in the classroom or is it actually for outside when you're not I there? I think, uh, as I understood, and I think I have to correct myself because I said 50,000 to half a million, I think it's 500,000 to now 5 million uh, users, so uh, I made them too small. Um, I think, as I understood it and as we talked, it's more outside so that um, teachers can communicate uh, with their students and classes outside of the classroom and also have this educator to educator exchange not only within your state but nationwide. Yeah, I mean, which is a very good idea. And there's a lot of material the teacher wants to communicate with the class beyond the classroom, and this mm -hmm. uh, looks like a wonderful way of doing it. I mean, it's got the adaptive component, it's got the social component. Yeah. Um, did I see some game mechanics in there as well? Possibly. Um, so um, it sort of wins from every angle, really. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, the, the nagging question is the business model, because when Ning uh, made their individual Ning's uh, paid, um, educators left like <laughs> in masses. Yeah, but I, I see a little bit. Um, so, so probably when you come from the uh, angle of the principals or the schools, they they just say, okay, we see that that makes sense, and uh, we are going to pay this. Um, yeah subscription or, or whatever for for our school. If it's individual educators, I see them using um, free services increasingly and, and being on every new service as long as it's for free. Yeah. And then as soon as the startup adds their business model, uh, they, le they leave as quickly as they came. Yeah. So, which Very is a true. little bit uh, tricky for startups, I feel. But yeah, but I feel, I mean, these guys are focusing in schools. And I think schools yeah. are in a very strange position now in that everybody feels like they should have some e-learning thing, mm -hmm. but no one's really sure what or how it works or what will be good. Or, mm. um, but everyone feels obliged to have something. Um, so there's a lot of, for a, a company that's delivering good value, there's definitely, I think, every school's probably set aside a budget for this. So there's plenty of revenue yeah. in that way. And um, I think uh, I have, uh, I'm just reading, um, so uh, their mission is to stay free forever. <laughs> so, uh, so, oh, um, really? Yeah, well, I think uh, maybe you have some uh, philanthropists as investors, maybe, um, or, um, well, the ad model is still open, so... Um, so yeah, making some revenue. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think not, the ad, yeah. ad model is going to be very controversial if you're taking yeah. it to high schools. Um, I think so it's too. probably the one place where you might not be able to do it at all. I think so too. So we will see. I mean, Reed Hoffman is a pretty big name. It's so absolutely. usually, uh, or let's say he knows how to, or I trust that uh, he know how to figure it out and, yeah. <laughs> and come up with something. Um, 
interesting and maybe maybe innovative. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It seems like there's something crucial that they're not telling us, doesn't there? Mm. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, then um, Must Reconnect raises 1.1 uh, million. And our last story, um, I will reserve. Uh, do you have some uh, some ideas on, on Must Reconnect? Um, again, it's one I haven't really used, and I'm not really sure what the differentiating factor here is between other things in this space. So it's kind of difficult. Again, 1.1 million is a small amount of money. Yeah. This is almost, I have to say, what is now considered uh, coming a little bit, but this again is, uh, is another story. Are we coming into this uh, investment bubble? Before it was some solid um, angel investment. Now 1.1 million is uh, almost considered as a seed funding. Yeah. So, so, and they announce it like that, that they receive 1 million in seed funding or over 1 million in seed funding, which, yeah, I think uh, illustrates quite nicely a little bit this um, eroding, uh, eroding ecosystem of the, the VC, the super angel, the angels, and the seed money. So it's pretty interesting to follow this. Yeah, I mean, they're key USP seem to be this real-time mm -hmm. data, real-time so, yeah. feedback. Yeah. And, and how are they getting that? So is the student completing exercises online sort of, and then providing real-time feedback? If, if that's the case, then, you know. Yeah, probably. And, and having this, uh, again, um, collaboration between uh, teachers seems to be um, something uh, a lot of people see value in. So here, teachers collaborating in uh, developing those assessments um, mm -hmm. and yeah and then um, having again common common universal standards uh, applicable to each individual state yeah we yeah. have to see I mean, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you know there are big players in that space already, and mm -hmm. they're sort of coming in with a very small amount of money. So they're going to have to differentiate themselves quite well to get mm -hmm. anywhere, I think. But I mean, let's see. First round, they've got one million to play with. Maybe they can come up with something. Cool. Yeah. Last uh, story effed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a story from uh, actually uh, Alaska. So KTUU um, station, TV station, um, brought this story to us, I think, last week or, or two weeks ago. So basically, um, the college claims that um, they were able to, to track to the homes on the campus um, that fraudulent activities of downloading BitTorrent and so on took place. Their way to solve this problem is to simply slowing down all students' internet. What mm. do you think? Isn't that mind-boggling? <laughs> it is. Uh, and I think this is a problem that's never going to go away for universities. So, I mean, I remember when I was un at university, it was when Napster was big and things like that. Yeah. And everybody was trying all sorts of downloading, and no matter what sort of restriction the university put in place to try and stop it, someone would find a way to overcome it and, you know, get through. And the university had all sorts of problems with, you know, bandwidth being used, viruses spreading, things like this. Um, I, I think it's almost, I'm going to say it's a fact of life, students do stuff like Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And you yeah. can't completely block them. Uh, yeah, and I mean, um, and it's true, it was exactly my time uh, at university as well. So um, on the one hand, imagine, but that's a, that's a side note, um, imagining how big Napster uh, has been or, or was, we have to say, and now not being around anymore is somehow... Weird, but but this story is so in in Alaska. I mean, illegal downloading, but BitTorrent works like works extremely well yeah. on a low bandwidth, so Absolutely. they don't do themselves any kind of favor. 
on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, I mean, there's also legal downloading, and mm -hmm. um, it's always such a small amount of people who do that, like, extremely often. I mean, probably, yes, a larger amount once or, or occasionally does something. So, but I think the bigger amount of students uh, frequently now use the internet to learn, to get information, Absolutely. and to download legal things, mm -hmm. and slowing them down, and then simply giving the explanation, um, still at lower speed, you will be, or you would be able to, to search what you need for college, I think is an argument that is, is sort of beyond... It, it makes no sense at all, does it? Life, yeah. I mean, I mean, I couldn't... I mean, you, 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 you couldn't watch a lecture on the internet anymore um, or even educational um, things on YouTube and, mm. and downloading, simply accessing data. Um, I mean, we need and we are so used to high-speed internet. Um, yeah. I don't see that this is something um, they, they did themselves a, a favor with a, at all. No, I mean, I'll be very surprised if this policy lasts very long, because, I mean... Yeah, it's... I hope it won't. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'll mean all the faculty are restricted, everything is basically going to stop, and and really the guys doing the illegal downloading are still going to be using a large amount of bandwidth. They're just going to be doing yeah. it over a longer period of time. Yeah, so, so... we'll see. Um, yeah, I think they've underestimated the amount of free time students have to find <laughs> ways around their <laughs> security policies. But and I mean, that's it. That stimulates their creativity. So, mm -hmm. um, as you said, uh, there will always be somebody finding a way how to get around and, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not effective. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Um, okay. That would actually put me off going to that university. So I was considering. I mean, you're already in Alaska. And yeah. Sort of the one of the... Um, not against Alaskans, uh, people in Alaska now, but um, uh, sort of one of the most remote cold places with a long winter, I can imagine. So you decide studying there, mm -hmm. and then you don't even have uh, access to high-speed internet. Uh, it would be very upsetting and <laughs> off-putting for me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, yeah, hopefully they are going to rediscuss and eventually change that policy again. Good. Shiv, thank you so much. Our, well, our <laughs> is over, but uh, I really enjoyed um, doing this episode and having such a good talk with you again. And um, so tell us at the end, where can people find your work online and uh, where, you, where do you... Uh, like direct them to go? Um, languagelab.com is the easiest place. So we do English language training in the virtual world, mostly general English, business English, and we have aviation English coming out very soon as well. Um, I, I don't know if that, that was in the newsletter. Blog. Oh, yes, you did? I okay. That on the blog, and we can only uh, recommend your, your company blog, um, written by Jessica. Yes. Um, very interesting. Uh, interesting links to find, not only about uh, Language Lab, but the whole, uh, yeah, online online learning, online education uh, world. So this is also a place to go. Um, is it blog dot language lab dot com? Yep, blog dot language lab dot com, and everything else will be linked from there. And uh, Shif is at Shif fifty three on Twitter. Yep. So that's also um, a good way to find interesting links. Um, and is that it or any any other? That's place? it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. So once again, thank you so much. And I hope you've enjoyed it a little bit as well. <laughs> oh, no, I've had a great time. And uh, now I won't take any more of your time as you're a busy CEO and have to lead a company. But uh, thanks so much and would love to have you as a regular on Review Ed again. Yeah, I'd love that. Cool. Thanks a lot, Kirsten. Thanks That's so absolutely much. brilliant.